well with the heat, so that means that they generally live at only high latitudes or high latitudes. There are 30 pica species. Um, there's two in North America and the other 28 are in Asia. And here I have their, um, their ranges all mapped out on top of each other. And you can see that um, here there's as many as eight different species ranges overlapping each other. And so the most species occur in the Himalayan mountain range Tibetan plateau area here. And there, um, so there are, it doesn't really matter if you can't read the names, but there are th uh, three main pica clades. And um, here is a more important part. I have their elevational ranges all mapped out. So each species occupies a very different elevational range, with some going down to sea level and others going all the way up to 6,400 meters. So a huge range. And um, about half of these species occupy elevations of 4,000 meters or higher. And that's, that's a pretty extreme elevation. So most of those species are occurring in the Himalayan mountain range, where we see the most species are occurring. Um, this is a photo of Mount Kunsunjunga, which is the third highest peak in the world. And this is taken from one of our field sites. So there's pikas at, at the base of these giant mountains. So they're way up there in the Himalayas. And at 4,000 meters, where we see all these species, there's only about 60% of the oxygen that there is at sea level. Um, and that puts a huge amount of stress on the physiology of any organism. So much so that pretty much every vertebrate that's been studied to date that lives in the Himalayas has some sort of genetic adaptation to deal with the hypoxic stress of that environment. Um, so that includes all of these guys shown here in addition to others, so the snow leopard, the Tibetan yak, even the Tibetan massive dog breed. Um, of course, humans we know a lot about, the barfeted goose, um, etc. And one species that occurs um, in this very desolate environment more so than any of those other species that we know much less about their genetic adaptations are pikas. Um, and pikas are extremely important to this environment. Uh, they're the base of the food web. Um, I could go on and on about their importance and I'm happy to talk about that more after. Um, and we know less about how they're dealing with the hypoxia of their, of their environment. Um, additionally, we know from uh, the American pikas around here, uh, or in, around California, that uh, they're moving up in elevation in response to climate change. So we know a little bit about how this is occurring in the Himalayas. We know more about how it's been occurring in the US. Um, but we know that their prehistoric range used to be down to sea level during the last glacial maximum. And because of their temperature sensitivity and increases in temperature, they're getting forced to higher elevations. Um, so their current range is shown here in green and is projected to increase. Currently is increasing at an average rate of 13 meters per year up in elevation. So these high elevation species that are already way up there are getting forced higher and we don't know much about how they're already dealing with this hypoxic stress. <coughs> so because these, uh, these animals are moving at a rather relatively quick rate, um, we're turning our attention to plasticity and gene expression as a mechanism um, that's allowing them to deal with this, uh, that's allowing them to deal with it at a more rapid scale than genetic adaptation, which is happening on the evolutionary time scale. Um, so part of my research is looking at actual mutations in the DNA um, that are gonna be giving them some adaptations. But for the work I'm showing today, I'm looking at plasticity and just upregulation of genes in response. So gene expression changes in response to hypoxia have been less well studied than all those other examples I, gave, I pointed out of genetic adaptations. So we know from studies on Andean humans, um, as well as the rufous collared sparrow in the Andes and uh, deer, deer mice, that there are a bunch of genes, uh, hundreds of genes that are getting differentially expressed in response to hypoxia. And we're hoping to add pikas to this list to get a better idea of which genes they're um, up or down regulating in response to hypoxia. So in order to do this, we're focusing on um, the species Okatona broilii. Um, so now I have their ranges all in different colors, and Okatona broilii is the one in bright green there, so it occupies uh, the western Himalayas. And uh, this species, again, it's only important to see this part. So they're uh, part of the Conothoa sub, uh, subgenus, and they occupy elevations from three to 5,000 meters. So we did our field work in the state of Himachal Pradesh in northern India. And if we zoom in there, um, so here's Himachal Pradesh, it's right on the uh, Tibetan border. And specifically, we were doing our work in Spiti Valley. Uh, and we had three different sampling locations. I'm gonna orient this so we can see the elevation
away from the princess a little bit better. So we had one low elevation site at 3,600 meters, one high elevation site at 5,000 meters, and one mid elevation site at 4,000 meters. And this um, our field work consisted of uh, live tracking, trapping pikas in baited traps. Um, sometimes they got the meal without paying the price. <laughs> and uh, we didn't, we just uh, anesthetized them, took the blood, and let them go where we found them. Um, and with those blood samples, we stabilized RNA uh, using Kyogen RNA to detect animal blood system and extracted RNA with that. We sequenced all this data on the Illumina platform, and all of this work was done in Bangalore in Thor Ramakrishnan's lab at NCPS. So again, for those of you that are interested in data, so we had um, 20 to 55 million reads per sample. We corrected for Illumina error and removed hemoglobin mRNA, which uh, removed of more than half of all of our reads. So we were left with three to 15 million reads per sample. Uh, then we uh, quality controlled the data and mapped it to the American pica transcriptome, uh, which is 26,000 contigs. The American pica is somewhat distantly related, shown here, is about 15 million years diverged, uh, which is unideal, but it's the closest relative that we have with some sort of reference. Um, I am also processing this data to do my own de novo assembly, but we uh, are just kind of going down this road to begin with. So even though it's somewhat distantly related, it still mapped 47 to 48% of all of our reads. And uh, I'm processing this data down with a few different pipelines. Um, this one here shown in green is what I'm going to show you our preliminary results for, um, using Quistos, Luke, and David, um, but I'm also going down other avenues um, to find Functional, uh, functional categories of genes that are um, enriched. So in comparing the, this high elevation group at 5,000 meters with the low and mid elevation group, we found 35 transcripts that were significantly um, downregulated in the high elevation sample compared to the low elevation samples, and 19 transcripts that were upregulated. Um, what this data looks like, uh, we can kind of look at one transcript and see that uh, in a bunch of these cases there's just a lot we very obviously see a higher transcription occurring um, in these high elevation individuals compared to the mid or low. And if we look at the 35 transcripts that are downregulated, there's no uh, significant enrichment in, in those genes for any go category or pathway. But in the 19 transcripts that are upregulated, we see a very significant enrichment for the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. Uh, the respiratory chain go category and the electron transport chain go category. Um, this was really exciting for us because uh, my previous work has focused on just that, on the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, because this pathway has already been a target um, of a lot of hypoxia adaptation studies because it's uh, very important. It creates 95% of the energy of the cell and is also highly reliant on oxygen. So, um, so we know just from what it does that it's really important um, it probably is going to be undergoing uh, pressure due to hypoxia. Also, out of those uh, species that I showed you, we already know about their genetic adaptations. A number of them shown here, those adaptations are in this pathway, um, as well as uh, two of those studies that I said have already looked at gene expression are finding that genes in this pathway are being upregulated um, under hypoxic stress. So this is really interesting um, that we're seeing stuff in line. And again, this is very preliminary results, but um, uh, we're excited about that so far. And so this, in this study so far, we're looking at species um, where they are. And what would be most exciting, we think, is to look at, uh, look at how one individual is changing when you actually move them. Um, and for a long time, we thought we wouldn't be able to do that type of experimental study. But it turns out that there's one population of pikas in captivity right now. Uh, they're very hard to keep in captivity because they're very sensitive animals. Uh, but at the Minnesota Zoo, they have a captive population, and I was able to go and work with them. And this is the species of Petona durica, whose range is shown here in blue. So it's mainly from Mongolia, but also comes up onto the Tibetan Plateau a little bit. And uh, this is from the third of the three subgenera, and um, it occupies elevations from about sea level up to 4,000 meters. And what I was able to do with these pikas is I had four of them and I put them in uh, cages and then put them in a hypoxia tent and was able to repeatedly sample these individuals. So um, at sea level and then after five days at 2,000 meters and after five days at 4,000 meters. And with this data, we're hoping to see uh, 
um, which genes, like within an individual, are getting uh, up or down regulated in the indirect response to hypoxia. And here we've been able to control for all these other um, uh, factors that we don't have any control over in the field. Uh, so with this work, what I'm hoping to shed light on is not only how our clinic is dealing with hypoxia, but through that information, get a better idea of um, their ability to respond quickly um, in moving their ranges as we're seeing them do, and whether they'll really be able to pack up and head to higher elevations, um, if that's what climate change is going to be forcing them into. Uh, so with that, acknowledgments and I'll